Welcome back to the Boomerang Podcast. I'm Matt. And I'm Drew. And uh, we're here for another episode, and we're excited to have Jen Horn join us today. Jen is the host of The Morning Answer with Jen and Grant on AM 590 and AM 870, The Answer. She also does the Gold Standard Radio Show on AM 870 with our very own Ken Russo. Jen, you pretty much, you know, cover all the local and national news, politics, breaking news, and world events. So we're excited that you're joining the Boomerang Podcast today and really happy to have you on and pick your brain. Well, I'm excited to be here with you guys and a big congratulations. I know you are just starting out the podcast and I'm super honored to be your second guest. And uh, and I love it. I love we need more voices out there spreading the truth and good information for sure. Yeah, thank you for coming on, Jen. Um, and it's so nice to see you whenever we do the events in Southern California. You, you and Grant are like, you know, so gracious, so warm hearted, like meeting you guys. You guys are terrific. So. Uh, well, really... I don't know about Grant, but I mean, I really <laughs> try. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Grant's terrific. But um, yeah, just jumping into it. it. Uh, you were at the Republican debates last night. What was your take on it? What, what went on? You know, it was really interesting. I wish I could say that I was blown away and that it was gangbusters, but um, I was pretty disappointed, actually. I thought there was a lot of chaos. I don't think that there was a lot of great control um, by the debate moderators. I do think that you had a lot of candidates who were just busy tearing each other apart, tearing down Donald Trump, not really focusing on Joe Biden, not really trying to articulate their message. Um, but it was interesting. Being at the Reagan Library is, first of all, it's absolutely gorgeous up there. If you're ever in Southern California, you should definitely go to the Reagan Library. It's beautiful. They always have traveling exhibits as well. Right now they have one on Auschwitz. And it's actually near the Midas Gold office up in Thousand Oaks. So you can just come right down after you visit and go to the Reagan Library. It's phenomenal. And it was not lost on me. I actually spent a moment sitting outside and watching everybody kind of come in and and seeing the final resting place of President Reagan. And you wonder who he would be supporting in this presidential election. You wonder where he would he would fit in all of this. But I have to say, I, there were 500 members of the media there, 700 members of the audience. Um, each campaign got to bring in 10 individuals. So that was another 70 people. I think there were four or 500 Reagan, RNC, and Fox business staffers on the premises. So it was buzzing. But I don't know if it was buzzing because of the excitement to watch the candidates or just for the excitement of perhaps another debate, I really feel that there was something missing, like an enthusiasm missing, because of course, President Trump was not there. And I don't blame him for not showing up. In fact, I can understand why he didn't. He's so far out in the polls. So why really this debate seemed like it was a debate for second place more than anything else. Yeah, and well, that being said, did anybody you know make some ground to come into that second place? Or did, you know, majority of the event just say, OK, you know, these three candidates, they need to drop out. You know, let's thin yeah. it down a little bit. Um, who shocked you? Who kind of let you down? I think just going through, first of all, it's worth noting because I am a President Trump fan. I'm going to vote for him again unless something catastrophic changes because you can never say never in politics. Right. It's one thing you learn really fast. But as of right now and as it was in 2016 and 2020, I will vote for President Trump again. It was interesting to note that at the foot of the Reagan Library, you come up a big hill to get to the top. There were all kinds of Trump supporters down there. So he was represented uh, the Reagan Library seemed like it was in MAGA country. On the debate stage, um, just because starting on the outside, on the outside corners, you had Doug Burgum, who I think performed really well, but I just feel like it's a little too late for him. He has not a lot of name recognition. And I think at this point, he's probably working to become a member of the Trump cabinet, perhaps. Right. Um, maybe energy secretary, something along those lines. Um, although I did like his message. I, I didn't get turned off. They by just never what, let him talk. They never ask him any questions. You know, he exactly just stands there. Right. So it's and unfair. He's the kind of the forgotten guy on the stage. Mike Pence, I think, is suffering kind of this, I don't know, this existential crisis. I don't, he blew I, it with Mike Tucker Pence, Carlson. Yeah, right. I mean, Mike Pence was a great yin to Donald Trump's yang in 2016. He provided structure, stability, kind of a sense of seriousness, and he gave... Um, people of faith, I think a little bit of, I don't know, just feeling like there is somebody there that was watching out for them. Of course, we know that President Trump was the most pro-Christian president probably that we've had in, in our lifetime. But watching Pence now, it's almost like he's trying to become this badass. Like, I don't know, somebody told him he's too nice maybe. And so now he's trying to, to be this kind of tough guy. And it just doesn't seem authentic. It's not, and a, I think not a good look on him. 
It's not. And I think, you know, you've already lost the Trump base of the party because of January 6th and his actions after January 6th, some of the things he said. So you've lost those people. And I don't think you're winning anybody else over, any independence over with a personality that doesn't seem true. So uh, there is a major problem with him. I think he's got to be the next to go along with Asa Hutchins, who didn't even make the stage. Uh, you had Senator Tim Scott, who I like very much, but I don't think has done himself any favors, almost like Mike Pence. I think he is trying hard to assert himself and articulate his platform, but I just don't think he's figuring out how to do that without you know, getting rolled over by everyone else. Chris Christie um, is a great debater. I like nothing that he says right now. I think it feels like a very personal vendetta against Donald Trump, which is not the goal. We should all be like super focused on the terrible stuff that the left is rolling out in our country and that Joe Biden is leading us into. So right. I, I think Chris Christie is so misplaced. Nikki Haley, I think, will be the if she isn't already by the time we air this podcast. Nikki Haley is obviously now the darling of the establishment. They're going to try to run with her. But I, I think that she's a little too swampy. I don't think she's resonating. And quite frankly, as a woman, it's hard to find that sweet spot where you are tough and you're taken seriously without sounding too hard or too masculine. And I think she's struggling with that. And then finally, Ron DeSantis, who has been, I think, a great governor for Florida, but has been a complete disappointment when it comes to how he's run his presidential campaign. I, I mean, I can't even at this point think about voting for him in the future. And that's tough because I thought he was going to be the future of our party. And it really it, it seems that he is flailing. He's another one who I think got bad advice, but he also is having trouble um, with the it factor, the charisma that you need. It's not that he's not smart. It's not that he didn't have great policies in Florida. But do people see the it factor? Do they see you in the Oval Office? That's a big piece of it. It may not be the best. It may not be the, the most important thing. But for people who vote, who don't pay attention to this stuff as closely as we do, it really matters. And I think he really suffers in that department, really Hundred percent. I, I think charisma department. Before he announced that he's going to run for president, he had just everything he was doing right in Florida. A lot of support, the yeah. Trump support. Uh, people very excited, and I feel like he's lost even some support just by running for president, running against Trump. I think he was mm -hmm. better suited waiting four more years, being the darling. Everybody we thought like he's going to be the next generation coming up. Um, so I think he might have maybe long term kind of you know hurt his odds. So yeah. that's my two cents. Absolutely. So I think as far as the stage goes, I really think we are looking for a number two. And then at the debate, what was really funny and very telling is that most of the media, mainstream and conservative, were more excited to see California's governor, Gavin Newsom, show up than they were excited to see any of the candidates on the stage. Oh, and we forgot Vivek, Vivek Ramaswamy, who I think is very interesting. I think he has an absolute bright future ahead of him. I think he's just, he needs a little seasoning. You know, he's no like experience. a steak that needs a little more time on the grill. Uh, and I, I think at some point he has a big future, but I do see him as someone who sits in the Trump cabinet or plays a role in his administration rather than the actual president himself. Absolutely. Uh, another podcast that we did, you know, mentioned, you know, bringing him in as the technology czar, right? Allow him exactly. to kind of, you know, be able to learn how to navigate through the swamp, what DC is all about. He's a successful you know. guy. Yeah, 100%. So mm -hmm. I just think, you know, coming in as a VP right now may not be in his best interest, but I think being a part of uh, the cabinet in one way or another could be really good for him. Yeah, I think that that's a great idea. I think finding a place for him is, in, is important. I think he's got great ideas. And look, Every single one of those people on the stage, including Asa Hutchinson and Chris Christie, we have a very broad tent. We have a very big umbrella in which we can use these candidates to bring in one more person to the Republican Party. I think Vivek brings a lot of people into the Republican Party. He's young. He's exciting. He has he does have the charisma and the it factor. So if he can bring people into the Republican Party, keep people interested and engaged, I think that's that's a great thing that we can ask from him. And I think he does. Of all the candidates there, it seems to me he has the brightest future. Um, I'd also say, just back to Gavin Newsom for a moment, that everybody was fanning out over the fact that Gavin Newsom was showing up. Now, I've lived in California my whole life. I've seen terrible policies rolled out, especially in recent years from Jerry Brown and now from Gavin Newsom. I know what he can do to our country if he becomes president, but guys, 
it's scary. Everybody was excited to see him, including the conservative media. He went to the spin room not once, but twice. He was in the spin room before the debates. He was in the spin room after the debates. He talked to everybody. He talked to Breitbart. He talked to Fox News. He talked to these conservative outlets. And he knows how to do a mic drop moment where he answers a question, even if it's not 100 percent true. He knows how to handle all this stuff. He mic drops and then he moves on to something else. He is slick. He is slimy and he is very scary because I think I know what he can do if he is the president using the power of that office to California, the country. And I hope that people are smart enough to recognize it. But if I saw anything at the debate, it's how good a politician he is. And it's frightening. And what a nightmare scenario where you have Gavin Newsom, who's just so yep. silky smooth with the way he talks. Great politician, terrible policies. Um, you know, it makes me think about, you know, Joe Biden and, you know, is this guy even going to make it to 2024? And mm -hmm. if he were to drop out, you know, here comes Gavin Newsom being able to slide in again with very little time for, you know, the right to be able to show America like this guy is, you know, a slimy politician and he's not going to be good for the country. But if you bring him in at the 11th hour, you know, there's just not a lot of time to be able to attack him. He avoids scrutiny. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, there's a couple of things that when I go out and I'm blessed to be able to go out and speak to, to groups around California and, of course, get to talk with people on my on my morning show and in the radio shows that I do. And one of the things that people ask me most is if Joe Biden will be on the ballot. And I, you know, I struggle with this one because obviously if I'm thinking like a Democrat strategist, my answer would we would hope probably not because right. he's not only corrupt, but he's demented. You can't give him a pass using one of those things, right? We can say that this guy was guilty of probably defrauding the American people, enriching his family. Now he is in mental decline and he is not making good choices and he is not, he's allowing people to control him. And there is just all sorts of bad stuff that's going on with Joe Biden. He doesn't look like he can handle another four minutes, right? much, much le less another four years in office. So, and, you know, the thing is, if he were to just say, hey, uh, I'm going to step down, I'm not going to run for reelection. A lot of the scandals mm -hmm. and everything that he's going through right now probably would just kind of fade away. Right. Exactly. And I just think that that would be the best thing for the Democrats. However, he's just so power hungry and I, I just don't think that he's going to give it up. Right. I think he's going to even if it's the, what's worse for the I country, worse for the Democratic Party and selfishly. And I think you might feel the same way, Jen, is like I want him to run. I want him to be on the ballot because I know Trump can beat him in 2024. A thousand percent. And this is why I struggle with the idea of this impeachment inquiry, which we're seeing get underway now from Republicans in the House. Look, do I think that Joe Biden did a lot of bad stuff? Absolutely. In my heart, I believe that this guy should be penalized. He should pay for the fact that he sold influence. He peddled influence. He used our tax dollars to enrich himself and, and his family. That is wrong. He should be prosecuted for that. He should have his day to defend himself, of course, but it's bad stuff. But in my heart, an impeachment's a great idea. In my head, I think, why are we doing this right now? Because with every step, whether it's the impeachment or his failing health, it gives Democrats one more reason to put the pressure on Joe to get him out of the race. And Joe Biden is truly the easiest person that we could run against right now right. because we've seen what four years can do. And so when I have people ask me, how are they going to bring in Michelle Obama? How are they gonna bring in Kamala Harris? How are they gonna bring in Gavin Newsom? It's tricky because realistically, to get on the ballot, you have to make sure that you are a declared candidate in each state. And the first deadline is October 16th in, a, in Nevada. And then they come fast and furious after that, where you have to be a declared candidate to be on the ballot for 2024. So unless Gavin Newsom has gone to Nevada in some super secret operation and put his name on the ballot, he is not officially running. So what happens? Well, I've heard people like Rick Rennell and others who have said, well, the way that they could do this is let Joe Biden be on the primary ballot, see what happens with the impeachment or with his health. If they have to make an excuse to get him out, they can do that. And then at the convention, convince the delegates to bring in someone like Gavin Newsom at the last minute. Now, this is not the way our country works because that wouldn't be a represent representative form of government right. because people would vote and they wouldn't be able to vote for Gavin Newsom. They'd have the party elites bring him in. Right. That to me is probably the most likely scenario if Joe Biden is not the candidate. Um, the other piece, and I've heard this one from multiple sources, and it's interesting, is that Gavin Newsom as governor of California would replace Senator Dianne Feinstein, who is 174 years old, give or take a day, with uh, Kamala Harris, and then 
he would become vice president to Joe with the understanding that Joe would step down and Gavin Newsom would be president. I think that is totally false. I've seen it in several social media circles. I've heard it on radio. I've heard it from my friend, Grant Stinshield. Kamala Harris has already been senator. She is also extremely aggressive and ambitious. She is not going to go back to being a senator. Nope. She is going to stay where she is. And so for anybody who thinks that Kamala is going to go without a fight, no way. Because she was promised something by the party. So it's hard to know what's going to happen. But no matter what it is, it's going to be slimy. It's probably going to be pretty scummy. And I guess we'll just have to watch and see how they maneuver through this. So I guess just, uh, you know, wrap up the convention part. I would say sounds like the winners are Trump and maybe even Newsom. Sounds like he was more popular, mm -hmm. you know, at the convention than uh, a lot of the Republicans. And then the loser would be everybody that showed up on the Republican side, even though, yeah. you know, maybe uh, Haley did all right. And um, but, you know, nobody made a splash. I think it was just about, you know, DeSantis, you know, to come off. Uh, I think Grant even said earlier, whiny, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, just uh, was you know. back, I believe was what he said. <laughs> yeah, was back. That's right. Um, so, you know, nobody made a splash. So anyways, I think yeah. Trump and Trump's Trump, so smart by not doing these. And debates. he did a great job at the union uh, auto uh, auto workers. I mean, yeah. Trump's Trump speech was excellent. It's like it he's was, just and mm -hmm. he's found ways. And I think this is the right move for him is that. Because he was already president, this gives him the leg up over all the other candidates. He was already president. So what can he do? He can show how he would be a better leader than Joe Biden. So whether it was the train derailment in Ohio, I thought it was great that Trump showed up to that. I think he should go to the border. I think he should go to places that Joe will not go. And that was going to be the United Auto Workers strike until Trump said he was going to go. And then, of course, Joe Biden said, uh-oh, or his team said, uh-oh, we better get him there, where he stayed for 12 minutes right. just to take some photos, <laughs> and he left. But people see through that, and that is how Trump will win the independence, which is what's going to determine this election. And you've already seen him. I mean, he's already picked up support from places where you wouldn't expect. And I think primarily you're going to see Trump's support with minority groups mm -hmm. grow. And that's because he is being recognized as someone who is being persecuted by the law, by the legal system. And people do not like seeing that there is a double tiered system of justice in this country. And I think they want to fight that. And with every day and every indictment and every ruling that doesn't seem just, he's picking up support. There's nothing those candidates on that debate stage can do to stop that, no matter how clean and good and charismatic and wonderful their policies are. Right. Plus, even minorities in the U.S., that typically would vote Democratic just across the board mm -hmm. without even looking at a ballot. Um, they're getting angry because now they're getting pushed aside for illegal uh, immigrants, right? Yeah. And now they're like waking up to, wow, these policies are crazy. It sounds cool to be a sanctuary city until you got to actually bring people in and, and house them and right. clothe them and take over hotels all over the place, right? And not to touch, you know, you think about the crime and drugs and all that, you know. So I just feel like minorities are like, wow, okay, the party that we've been 90% overwhelmingly voting for, you know, historically the Democratic Party, they're not doing anything for us. They're only making it worse mm -hmm. by their own policies. So it's kind of interesting dynamic to see the minority groups, you know, be like, wow, uh, we're going to vote Republican. We're going to vote Trump. Yeah, we need to close yep. the border up. Like nobody cares about us. Why are we caring about illegal immigrants? That's you when know, you know it's, the, that's the when the you know it's bad is when, is when the illegals start voting for Trump. That's when you know it's bad for the Democrats. <laughs> well, and this is the truth. I mean, you guys are absolutely – a hundred percent right, because you have black men now who are looking at Donald Trump as someone who is pushing through, pushing through the persecution and building something for himself. You have, you have blue collar workers who have already started to identify with Trump. They did that in 2016. But I say it all the time. I believe that Latinos and parents will save our state of California. Those are the groups that are being pushed with the cultural issues that are tired of it. So the more the leftists start to go after our kids and they see what Gavin Newsom is doing in California to parents and kind of laughing it off, saying it doesn't matter. That is resonating with people, especially Latino voters. And so this is where the Democrat Party, it may not be overnight. I'm not under any grand illusion that this is going to be like some sort of crazy landslide. Right. But I do believe incrementally using that Trump style, that populist leadership style, we start bringing in a lot more minorities that wouldn't normally find themselves in the Republican Party. Absolutely. Well, I want to jump a little bit over to uh, Bidenomics. Um, you know, we uh, have seven trillion of debt over the next few years that we're going to have to refinance. It's going to be really tricky. We got consumer credit card uh, debt over a trillion dollars. And then we got Bidenomics, you know, and I'm just curious, you know, if you could speculate on, on what you see, what you hear, 
Um, and how big of a mess Everybody's is it? Everybody's doing fine. Yeah, right. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Before we got together today, you had mentioned you wanted to talk a little bit about Bidenomics. And I said, you know, it's so funny what that term is because it was meant to be derogatory. Now Biden's picked up on it. And he's trying to use that as like his uh, his big phrase and it's working. And they're trying to tell us always that it's wonderful. Bidenomics is, uh, a, a, there's, you know, three kind of, I guess, layers to binomics, according to their definition. And it's about investing in America. It's about, um, uh, what else? It's about, oh, uh, building the middle class. It's about making sure that we uh, help people relieve their debt and all of these things. Basically, these three components of binomics don't quite sound like what we're seeing, right? Are we seeing the middle class flourish? No. In a place like California, where I live, we're seeing an increase in the number of rich and the number of poor. The middle class is getting wiped out. You're seeing Joe Biden decide to pay off people's student loan. But what is that doing? It's just putting more burden on taxpayers who maybe chose responsibly to pay off their student loan debt or worked through college so that they wouldn't have to collect any of that. And investing in American businesses, that's about creating a whole new industry of green jobs that aren't going to do anything to change the climate or the water temperature or the temperature of the earth by one tenth of one right. teeniest, tiniest percent. So it's just a bunch of nonsense. And yet they still try to tell us that it's working. And guys, I don't know about you, but at the Reagan Library, I had the opportunity to talk to people kind of quietly. And we we're talking about the media business as a whole, because the news media, of course, was was well presented there, a lot of them. And I said, yeah, the media business is having a tough, a lot of cuts. And everybody kept saying, yeah, well, my husband's business is doing this. And yeah, my wife's industry is doing this. I don't think it's getting a lot of attention, but something is going on. You may not see it every day. The stock market's a little rocky, a little up and down, but they keep trying to tell us everything's okay. It doesn't feel like that. I think very quietly, there is something happening right now where people are making cuts and tightening their belt and worried about what's coming down the road. I don't know if you guys are feeling that too, but it does seem like it's not the, um, the great, economy that I think President Trump even had just a few years ago. There's a crack in the foundation. And he was even spending too much. Well, we saw a video from the FDIC uh, November of last year where the FDIC, I don't know who got this footage, fantastic, but they were literally in a, you know, room you picture with the smoky room, right? It's the FDIC saying, hey, we got to cover up the the market signals and the banking signals that, right. you know, so there's no there's no run on the banks. And then what did we see? We saw SVB, right? Uh, First signature. Republic, Signature, mm-hmm. right? We saw the string of banks closing. We think, I mean, at least I know Drew and I think, I think we're going to continue to see that, more bank failures, and then they're going to consolidate yeah. into, you know, probably two or three banks. It'll probably be Citi, Bank of America, JP Morgan. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because just a a few months ago and talking about the banks, you've had six bank collapses already, which should get lots of attention. And that's just this year should get lots of attention. Nobody's talking about it. That's a huge story to have banks collapse for a number of reasons. Obviously, a lot of mismanagement, a lot of woke politics, a lot of stuff that's going on, of course, inflation, the interest rate. But in my community and you know, I don't want to name names, but it rhymes with Schmake of a Schmerica. Uh, my local branch shut down for six months because yep. they couldn't have employees. They didn't have they couldn't find people to work. So I'm lucky enough to live in Los Angeles some of the time. But and I have another branch, you know, this is probably 10 minutes up the road and I can use ATMs and all of that. So I was able to get a hold of my money. But think about it. If a branch in my community can't stay open, what is this saying about the banking industry as a whole? Are you going to be able to access your money if another bank collapses? You know, especially some of these smaller banks, not the big ones we're talking about, but some of the smaller banks, they go down. You're going to be able if they've got the closed on the door. How are you going to go in and get your money out? It's pretty incredible. And we were talking earlier, you asked about you know, financial advice and and what I would recommend. And I've been working with, um, with you guys, the folks over at Midas School Group and Ken Russo has been great in teaching me about what's going on. I never pretend to be a financial advisor or an economist or any of that. I'm all, I'm trying to learn as much as I can. But what I do know is I do know about personal responsibility. It's the reason why I consider myself to be a conservative. I think it's at the core of who we are as a country. Forget about your political affiliation, but we are Americans because we wanted to take our fate into our own hands. And if you are worried about 
Joe Biden, if you're worried about the global elites, about all these people just making decisions and printing money, devaluing our dollars, banks that can't stay open, what I know is that if you buy something like gold or silver to hedge some of your investments, you're protecting your wealth because you're bringing it home. You're the only one, your family's the only one that's gonna have control of that money. You don't have to rely on Bank of America, on Citibank. You don't have to rely on some kind of catastrophic collapse not happening. You are already safe and secure at home because you have a piece, a portion of your wealth. We work really hard. You don't want to see your money go down the drain because of inflation, because it's not worth anything anymore. And you also certainly don't want to see your money go down the drain if the banks are collapsing around you and you can't reach the money. Everybody loves FDIC insured. Well, what does that mean? They can't insure all of us. They don't (laughs) have it. Jen, you're hired. Jen, Jen, you're hired. hired. Yeah. (laughs) Is that pretty good? Am I okay? Pretty good. Yeah. Gold, silver, (laughs) ammo. We are. See, I think that should, it just makes sense. Absolutely. And and I think it's going to come down to, I mean, when we, look at uh, the the central bank digital currency, right? Mm -hmm. I think the implementation of that, one of the unintended consequences of implementing that will be people going to gold and silver again, just because they want the government out of their business. That's my I think it's huge. You know what's scary? I mean, it scares the bejesus out of me because I see, I saw what happened to the Canadian truckers. Yep. They beep their horns at the direction of Justin Trudeau and all of a sudden their money is taken out of their checking account. Do you really trust that our government won't go there. I mean, think about what we've seen. We've seen the IRS going after conservatives already. We've seen the FBI going after parents who just go to a school board meeting. We've seen them go after Christians for wanting to go to church. This is what the government's already capable of. And don't even get me started. They've already started their oversight on social media. You post a story they don't like, and they classify it as misinformation, whether it's true or not because truth no longer exists to them. It's just what's truth that benefits them. And they shut you down. So they're literally shutting down free speech and people are going along with this. So I'm sorry, but I don't want to be vulnerable to them saying, well, that's a conservative talk show host. Maybe she doesn't need to get that loan. Maybe she doesn't need to be able to access her money. Maybe we should put a hold on her her money because she's spreading misinformation. And that's what it, it is sounds, with these people. It's it's all about yeah, power. It it's all about control. And, you know, going yeah. into something like a CBDC digital currency, which I know they're like salivating, you know, at the lips to, to implement. And it's because they can't control. They can't say, hey, you are a conservative speaker. Yeah, your interest rate for your home loan is going to be 2% higher than, you know, the liberal person. Or you're eating too much red meat. We don't like that, right? It's going to cost you more money. Or you can't spend your money outside of a 10-mile radius of your home zip code, right? Because they can yeah. control that, which is really scary. So as Larry Fink said at BlackRock, we're going to have to force behaviors. Force behavior. Behavior. That's scary stuff. Isn't that nice? Isn't that, yeah, that's that'll keep, that should keep us yeah. up at night. So diversify, you know, gold, ammo, you know, take a little cash, but be your own <laughs> bank, take self-custody, you know, have that stuff at home. And, uh, you know, you got to have one foot in the system where you're paying your bills, you're using banks, right, et cetera. You have to. But any opportunity you can to take a little bit and pull it out of their system, right, and take self-custody is what we recommend. Yep. Yeah, it's it only makes sense because it is the safe, secure thing. And it again, it brings you back to that idea that you have control over your own destiny and you don't have to rely on big government that just keeps getting bigger. You don't have to rely on a banking system that's not there to benefit you. I mean, these guys are all benefiting the, the, each other. I never thought. And by the way, if I heard myself say this five or 10 years ago, I'd probably think I was a nut. But we've seen it now. We've seen that there is a class system in this country. It's them and it's us. And so how do we protect ourselves against them? Because they want to continue growing their wealth and their power. And so we have to take a little bit back, hold it on our own, and just be prepared. And hopefully we don't ever have to touch that money. Hopefully it just stays and gains wealth like gold has done historically. But boy, it makes you feel like you just have a hedge that's outside of the system. The scariest thing to me would be to be in all cash and all that money's in a bank right now. That would be... right. Very scary. <laughs> yeah, you get into counterparty risk. It's it's a nightmare, and that's why you know we recommend you know U.S. gold eagles, U.S. silver eagles, because it's constitutional, right? right? I think at the end of this, we might have to go back to the principles of the Constitution on many fronts, not even just the financial front. But that's why me and Drew, um, you know, we we recommend U.S. minted stuff. Um, I think that's the way to go. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And plus it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's a great thing to have at home. Absolutely. I mean, just to collect. I I always love when we do the gold standard every week, Ken will bring in something for me to take a look at. And I mean, it's just, it's incredibly, it, it's something great to have at home, not only for the benefits it gives, but it's also something beautiful. And you're right. It is something that's constitutional. You're holding on to something that's real that's based in America, right? I mean, most of it, I mean, you can get some of the other stuff as well. We're not going to turn our nose up at that, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Well, we'll send you something nice. Absolutely. Something pretty. I love yeah. it. Yeah. You know, we... I like anything that sparkles. <laughs> no one's got it better than us. Yeah. You look good in gold. Yeah. So there are we, go. are we going to see you uh, in a couple days here in, in SoCal? Guys, I cannot wait to see you in person. I'm so glad you're coming. We've got our town hall 2023 event. It's going to be awesome. It's October it 1st. It's the Universal Hilton, and we're going to yep. have Charlie Kirk and Dennis Prager and Mark Levin and Officer Brandon Tatum. It's going to be a lot of fun. Tatum, Officer Tatum walked off with a gold buffalo yeah, from the booth he's last funny. year. He's like, I'm taking this with me. Like, Come Officer, on. Sir, <laughs> sir. <laughs> he's, they're all fun. They're all great guys. And yeah, gals. and he's the police, so you can't even run yeah, after exactly. him. Like, what are we doing? Exactly. <laughs> what are we going to do? Tackle him? The guy's like, yeah, he's, he's a big guy. <laughs> he's a big boy. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on. I can't wait to see you guys. Um, you know, we're just trying to get our podcast up and running. We're having fun. And uh, we really, Great. you know, appreciate you taking yeah. the time. And please tell us one more time, like, how we can, uh, yeah. you know, listen to you. Absolutely. Okay, so you can listen to The Morning Answer. That's on AM870. You can download the app and listen across the country. And I host that with Brand Stinchfield, 6 to 9 a.m. West Coast time. I'm the world's busiest woman, so I host the Inland Empire Answer, which you can also get at AM590. You can download that app as well. I'm on with Sebastian Gorka and America First each Wednesday, 1 o'clock West Coast time. I do the Steve Hilton Show. You can download that. And I'm always at CRN at working with my dad, with Ken Russo, the gold standard. So you can check that out as well. And you can always follow me, Jennifer Horn, on Twitter and True Social and Jennifer Horn Radio on Facebook and Instagram. Right on. Check. Awesome. Awesome, Jennifer. And you Thank guys are awesome. I'll come back anytime you want to hang out. It was a lot of fun today. Thank you. Really appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank you for taking the time, Jennifer. Thanks, guys. We'll see you All soon. Right. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for watching. And uh, hit the like, share, and subscribe button. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode.